verses 1 through 7, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. While you're finding that to expedite time, we really give God thanks to Brother Cheatham who led us in uh, our prayer. Thank, you. Uh, thank God for him and you, brother. Uh, we, we are, uh, he and his wife, we're trying to make sure we have him uh, working as they, they come to us. I would say, just give God thanks. Sister Cheetah is teaching in the lady. Brother Cheetah is uh, working uh, with our brethren, so we give God thanks for that. But in his prayer, he mentioned 9-11, uh, uh, a very great time for this country, but also a time of victory and a time where we were able to rise up from the ashes. Yeah. And I'm mentioning this because uh, this week while I was at Walmart, just going about my business, uh, I was able, I ran into a very astute young man. Uh, I think of him as a professor. And I see him, hopefully in the future, being the next president of our country. Uh, yeah, I can hear him applauding. Uh, I'm going to ask him to make his way. Make his way to the podium at this time as uh, the person of Professor Niles Jackson. And the reason why I'm asking him to come forward is because he, he always amazes me. Uh, I've never heard a young person talk about the presidential election or ask piercing questions about politics and what's going on with the country. And so randomly, I'm walking through and he's with his aunt at Walmart and he says, he pulls my hand and says, Brother Case, uh, can we say something or do something on Sunday about 9-11? We need to do something about that. I don't know what we're gonna do. <laughs> So I think it just just because his heart is given to that, uh, I was just moved to ask him to pray. And since we're a people that believe in prayer as Americans, I want to read to you quickly just a short quote from President Obama as he he is uh, dealing with uh, he, he made was an interview rather with in regards to the 9/11 celebrations that's taking place right now. He says, we are still the America that looks out for one another. Bound by our shared belief that I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. In the face of terrorism, how we respond matters. And I believe the way we ought to respond as a church is through prayer. And so I think it's good to hear from the mouth of babes, how the Lord ordains praise. And so we want to hear our future president. Or elected official. I don't know why he's gonna do that. I believe we ought to speak life into our children. So let's just uh, close our eyes and humble our spirit at this time as now let's take us before the throne of grace and mercy. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer? Thank you for waking us up this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for grandparents, parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins, and friends. Pray for those who lost their lives 15 years ago in 9-11 tragedy. Pray for the families. Also, continue to pray for Brother Crenshaw. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thing to sit down. Yes. <laughs> but I want another thing to just 
give God thanks for Niles Hart. He also prayed for our evangelist. Let's not forget him as he is going through his recuperation stage. He's going through re rehabilitation. Let's keep him. Sister Crenshaw also, uh, our first in our prayers for health and restoration. And the Lord will cover the both of them and pray for the entire family. And as the Lord covers not only our evangelist, his wife, but also uh, his son. And, and then the whole family as everybody takes care of them. Let us be a church that responds to them, not only through prayer, but let's keep doing the things that we're doing uh, where that's concerned. Now, Luke chapter 15. Luke uh, chapter 15. Uh, the theme for this month, we're looking at home alone. I don't remember if uh, any of you remember that movie uh, with Macaulay Culkin. Y'all remember that? Home oh, Alone. Yeah. Uh, I think the famous scene for me was when he was uh, putting on aftershave yeah. and he, he he hits his face and he screams. Do you remember that part? Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, I love I love that movie. That is a, tr a trilogy uh, of how this young man uh, uh, braves uh, dealing with thieves and just being left by himself and making it and his family his family making this mistake of leaving him home by himself. And the whole drama of getting back to him, but before that takes place, he takes care of business, right? Uh, but I, I took that, that title and, and as a theme because I believe that there are members, a part of the spiritual family, who are here in this family, but they're home alone. Uh, they're dealing with life's issues by themselves. Yeah. And the devil is constantly trying to get into the door. And you've, you've been doing a great job in holding him off, but, but you're also doing it by yourself. And for whatever reason, you are left all alone. And But there are also some members uh, who are part of the spiritual family, but for whatever reason, they have left physically Though they are still here, they have left because of being offended, uh, a feeling of being alone, being overlooked, uh, being talked down to, and so they are gone. And as a church, I want to invite you, all of us, to participate in the effort of going to find the sheep. Is that all right? Now, on Mondays, I'm sure this week before, on Mondays, every Monday, Purpose Group leaders and future elders in training uh, get a text from me, and I call Monday, Find the Sheep Monday, all right? And I tell them either in form of a video or text message or scripture, let's go find those members uh, who are not here. And I don't know about you, but I'm concerned about our attendance. Yeah. I'm concerned of the, the empty uh, pews that you and I sit in. I'm concerned about those who used to be here. I could see smiling faces. I, I could remember people walking through the corridors, but they're not here. You may be like, preacher, why, why are we even talking about that this morning? I, I came to hear a word from the Lord. Well, the word from the Lord is he is concerned about every soul. And that's why I'm concerned, and we ought to be concerned. And here's why we're preaching this. Uh, uh, if you miss anything in the sermon this morning, I want to invite you to be a part of the joy of heaven. Everybody say the joy of heaven. The joy of heaven. And the joy of heaven is that every soul be saved and be snatched from the devil's grasp. Yeah. We're going to see it in this text in Luke chapter 15. In Luke 15, Jesus teaches profound lessons, and it's very familiar, a very familiar text. I'd like you to shake off the spirit of familiarity and just look, take a fresh look at Luke chapter 15. Now, let me tell you what's happening also behind the scenes, because I'm not only preaching this from the pulpit, but also we're, we're studying this together in Bible class. And since we started this on Wednesday night, uh, several uh, sisters and the elders in training have taken our responsibility. We have a list here, a uh, membership list from 2014. And what's happening is 
just so you know we're taking this seriously, I'm not just preaching another series, that the leaders in training, their wives and some other sisters are going through this list and combing it, going through name by name and making sure we identify those who are deceased, those who have migrated, are those who have moved their membership just to see who is here, who is a member here at Northeast. Because we want to be able to minister to the sheep. And so I'm letting you know that this is very important to us. Isn't that good? And so let's give our elders in training their wives and their sisters a love of God. So that's what's happening. Now, in regards to the teaching uh, from the pulpit, I will start this, this series, it's just three weeks, uh, looking at Home Alone. I will start, I'll have the first installment, then God's willing, a sheep who left the fold Amen. is back. Yeah. And he will stand before you on next week Sunday to bring God's word in the person of Brother Victor Black. Uh, amen. <laughs> Brother Black, uh, uh, Wandered away for a while. He's been back. He's been preaching and teaching at the Channel of the Church of Christ. Uh, he's been working there, working there this summer. He's going to continue preaching and teaching there. And he is also being, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Courted uh, by our own brother David Wilson to come to Brooklyn, New York to be the evangelism minister there. Wow. But while Victor is making that transition, he's going to come and share with us uh, in the second installment of this series, looking at the lost coin. So, uh, I want to encourage you to be here, to encourage Brother Black, but he's also coming to share with us. He's working with the Seaworth Academy, uh, working with uh, 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 our children, and he wants to come and to encourage us to become mentors for the children at Seaworth Academy. All right. All right, so respond to the word as he comes to preach but also respond to the effort of mentoring our youth in the community. Then the weekend of uh, the wedding. <laughs> God's willing, my best man and best friend and the person of Orlando Thomas will stand before you and wrap this installment up looking at the lost boys uh, in Luke 15. And so that's the lineup. I'm starting the relay. Uh, Victor will take the second leg, and then Orlando Thomas will come. Uh, since he's going to be here, he's been a, a best friend to me every time. No matter where he goes in the country, he always have me to come and preach, no matter what. And so he said, look, man, I'm coming. And I'm coming, and I'm staying. And so I want to be able to talk to God's people. So. Uh, Brother Orlando Thomas will stand before you uh, and preach the word, uh, looking at the lost boy. So, home alone, Luke, uh, chapter 15, let's start from verse, verse 1. Luke, chapter 15, and verse 1 uh, through 7. The text reads, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with him. Yeah. He sorry, eats with them. Yeah. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who what? Repents. Than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. If you're looking for a topic this morning, the topic is run away. Run away. In this context, Jesus 
deals with the issue that the scribes and the Pharisees have uh, with him uh, spending time with sinners. It says that all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Now that's very significant because in their culture, uh, the scribes and Pharisees saw tax collectors as being unclean. They also put tax collectors with sinners or Gentiles. Anyone who was against or would not keep the will of God were considered to be sinners or unclean. The scribes, the, 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 the teachers of the law and the Pharisees complained saying, this man receives what? Sinners and eats with them. I want to challenge this church this morning that we ought to be a church that receive sinners. Yeah. Yeah. We ought to be a church that's receptive to those who are lost. Matter of fact, I want to take it even further and say to us that we cannot be a little Bo Peep kind of church. Yeah, we cannot be a nursery rhyme kind of church. Y'all know that nursery rhyme? Uh, little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and can't tell where to find them. Leave them alone, and they'll come home, wagging their tails behind them. We can't afford to be a nursery rhyme kind of church uh, saying, just leave those sheep alone, and they'll make their way back home. But rather, the challenge this morning is that we ought to be about finding the lost sheep, whether those who don't know Christ or those who know Christ, and for whatever reason have left the fold, we ought to be concerned about each other. Yeah, we can't afford to say, well, it's up to them, it's their responsibility. They should have known not to leave. Uh, they should have been more spiritually mature. What Jesus is saying to us is, be careful we don't take on the attitude of the Pharisees and the scribes. Yeah. Now what's significant is, don't miss this, just walk with me for a minute, that the scribes and the Pharisees not only had a problem with tax collectors and sinners, because for them in their culture, the tax collector was a traitor. The Romans oppressed the Jews, and so what happened was that there were those who wanted to make ends meet and saw the, the opportunity to make some more money, so they will then work for the Romans and charge their own people taxes at a high rate so that they too could put some money in their pocket while paying the Roman government. Yeah. So the Jewish people saw these tax collectors as traitors, as unclean, as evil. How can you be a traitor to the people of God? I thought you were on our side. Yeah. But Jesus sat with the traitor. He sat with the tax collector. That says something to us that when we go about our business, we ought to take on the heart of our master. We ought to sit with traitors. Right. Yeah. We ought to sit with pimps and prostitutes. Right. We ought to sit with the alcoholics. We ought to sit with the disenfranchised. We ought to touch the people who we consider, who society deems as being nasty. Y'all got quite a one. We ought to be the type of church that goes out in the community and walk amongst the prostitutes and walk amongst the people in the bar. They're not telling them to, to partake uh, in, their, in their efforts and, uh, uh, and partake in their profit gaining. What I'm saying is that we ought to go into their environment and make them uneasy. Bring hope and life. We can't expect the world to always come to us. Right. Look at us. We are the people of God. No, Jesus went about in the community and he touched the lepers. He touched the prostitute. That woman that washed his feet with her hair, that perfume that she used to wash his feet was used for her profit gaining to sell her body, but she took it and she came and washed the master's feet. So what I'm saying is, we may need to do have a, 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 a what's that thing called a mob? What's this? A mob? You know a mob? Uh, give me the word. Flash mob. Thank you. Come on, people. Be a flash mob. Go in the clubs with neon shirts. 
church. And, and I don't know, I'm, I'm just saying, flesh mob the streets. Don't be okay with just coming to church and being okay with worshiping on Sunday and only on Wednesday. Jesus went. We can't afford, because here, here's why. If we, if we don't take on his attitude, we will become like Pharisees and scribes. Yeah, we started saying, how is it you eat with these people? These unclean people. Now watch this. He says, I mean verse go, go back to verse 2. Go back to verse 2. He says, so he eats with scribes and Pharisees. Look at it says that the Pharisees uh, complain, saying, this man does what? Receives sinners, and he does what? Eat with them. But that's significant. I'm taking my time through this because Northeast, we have to be a church that receives sinners and eats with them. They got to the picture, the idea in the, in the Greek, uh, when Brother Christian gives me uh, the microphone, give me the microphone, I have received the microphone. But that's all I did. I received it, and I may put it down. But in the context, what Jesus did was, he, he, he not only received it, the word received means to receive it, but also to have fellowship with. You see, they had a problem with it. Not only do we need to start being a church that says to the community, come and be a part of our worship, come and be a part of our ministry, but we need to also fellowship with them. But Brother Kiss, what does that look like? He ate right. with them. We need to get to know people, get to know sinners. But when I see Brother Mr. Christman, come on, I should have just said, man, I want you to come and worship with us on Sunday. And you're looking sharp, by the way, too. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, 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 yeah, it ought to be more than just coming to worship. It ought to be come to worship and let's go eat. Now, he may be a homosexual. I'm just walking down. I'm walking through a community. But he has a soul. He may be a gigolo. But he has a soul. He may be a liar. But he has a what? A soul. He may be a deadbeat dad who won't pay uh, child support and, and have all, all that, yeah. But he still has a what? Soul. So when I invite him to worship, I ought to be like Jesus where I receive him. I don't just shake his hand and say thanks for coming. I say let's go eat. Let's go drink some coffee. Let me get to know you, who you are, why you think the way you think? Because I want you to have a relationship, not with the church, but with Christ Jesus, and then with us. That's the kind of church we ought to be. You want to, yeah, and he said this too. The same picture is given in Matthew 18, when, G, when Matthew gives the same story, Jesus says, receive a little child, this little child, like how I receive you. We cannot afford to have superficial relationships. Now, I'm not telling you to make everybody feel your best friend. But what I'm saying is, when the time comes for ministry, we got to be real with each other. I got to get to know you. You got to get to know me deeper than just shaking hands. Deeper than just saying, how you doing, brother? You're looking good, looking sharp. What's up, man? What's up, man? Good. See you. All right. Peace out. That's what we do in the hallway. What he's saying is for us to go get the sheep, we have to do some work. It takes work to stay in a family, and we have to put our hearts in it. And I want to say to us as Northeast, let's refocus, let's re-energize, let's get ready to go find the sheep. But the question is, when we go find the sheep, what are they coming back to? Because if I don't know my brother, if I don't minister to my brother, if he doesn't minister to me, then when I go tell the sheep to come back to, then they're coming back to broken relationships. Does that make sense? Thank you, Brother Christian. Give him a little deposit. <laughs> now, this is significant because in the Jewish culture, when it says that Jesus eats with them, you got to appreciate in their culture, when they broke bread, the idea was, you are no longer a stranger to me, but you are now a part of my family. That person moved from being a stranger to becoming a part of the family. Uh, I want to suggest that sometimes 
members run away or leave the fold because they still feel like strangers. Right. We gotta stop, we have to stop being clickish. Yeah. I believe Oklahoma, and I'm not, not bashing now because uh, this, this is not my home. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm now an Okie. Yeah, I'm working on my citizenship, but, but I'm, 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 I'm becoming, I'm moving from being Jamaican to being a what? Okie. But I want to say about my Okie people is that uh, we are cliquish. We really are. I'm talking about in the community. As a result, it comes into the what? Church. And what I'm saying is we got to stop being cliquish and be okay with meeting new people and connecting with people and stop being superficial. Right. 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 So Jesus received them and he broke bread with them, meaning that when in their culture, when you break bread, it's saying, I am now vulnerable to you and you have moved from being a stranger to being a part of this. What does that look like? That means I will pray with you. I will talk with you. I will go drink coffee with you when an opportunity comes and you say, uh, pray for me because I'm, 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 I'm out of a job. I don't just say, brother, I'm praying for you. I try to find you a job. I may make some phone calls and say, look, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so out of a job. Is anybody here have a job for somebody? Uh, somebody needs some food. I'm going to take the time to find you some food. Maybe go to Walmart and buy you some food. My point is, superficial relationships won't work in God's kingdom, and it's time we stop. Yeah. So going forward, as of this day, we're going to be a church that not only receive, meaning not only to take, but I'm going to fellowship with you, but I'm also going to break bread with you and get to know who you are. But anyway, it says, so he said, he spoke this Bible to them saying, look at this, look at verse 4. What matter if you have in what? A hundred sheep. If he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that one, which is what? Lost. Until he what? Finds it. Let's park right there. What's interesting was, they had a problem with Jesus eating with the unclean people. Yeah. What's interesting was also in their culture that the scribes and Pharisees considered shepherds to be unclean. A shepherd was the lowliest, nastiest, demeaning job you could ever want to have. Matter of fact, shepherds were called thieves because they said, and it's written, it's in, it's in, the, it's in the Jewish uh, books, it's written that shepherds are thieves because shepherds will take their sheep onto other people's land. They will steal grass. So shepherds were considered to be uh, degrading. They were not respected. They were not loved. Now what's interesting is church, here are the doctors of the scripture. The people that were supposed to teach the people about what God says in his word. And it, it baffles my mind that they think that shepherds were the lowliest, nastiest, degrading occupation. But did they not read that they're the greatest king of Israel was a shepherd boy? Did they not read Psalm 23? That the shepherd boy wrote when he says, The Lord is my what? Shepherd, I shall not want. Did they not read Isaiah 40 and verse 12, where it says that God is the shepherd of Israel, and he holds a lamb in his bosom, he carries it on his neck, and he leads the sheep. Did they not read? How, and sometimes I want to say to us, Northeast, is that we could read the word and still miss what God is trying to say. We could become doctors and lawyers of the scripture. We could quote a scripture and tell somebody in a heartbeat when they're going to hell or when they're doing wrong, but we can't live what we quote. And what I'm saying is, when we go find the sheep, we gotta become careful that we don't go with scripture beating the sheep and telling the sheep, you should have done this, you ought to do this, and you need to come back or you're going to hell, or rather, use the word of God and draw them back to the fold. Right. Right. Gotta be careful yeah. that we don't, we know we become spiritually obese, wow. walking around, spiritually yes. obese, yes. look at me, I know scripture. 
and you don't use it. Yeah. Anyway, y'all think I'm crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they said, what man of you? <laughs> so Jesus, Jesus punches them in the stomach. He says, what man of you having a hundred sheep? How dare, how dare he now take the lowliest, nastiest occupation and put it with us? See what he did? See what he does? He says, think like a shepherd. He says, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that one, which is what? Lost. Until he what? Finds it. Now what's interesting is, uh, sheep, we all know, and it still baffles me, that throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, that God refers to his people as sheep. Because one thing we do know for a fact, Sister Stalwart, is that sheep are all dumb animals. Now I'm not calling anybody dumb in here, all right? But it's a fact that sheep are what? Dumb animals. <sighs> Y'all don't like that, do you? Jesus, while he's teaching, looks over and he sees the shepherd and he says, he says, uh, you spiritual leaders are to be like that shepherd who goes to find the sheep. Now when a sheep is grazing, when a sheep eats, watch me, the sheep eats like this. They walk like this. They don't look where they're going. They're always just walking what? With their heads down. They're grazing, looking for the next blade of grass, just, just grazing, eating up, getting fat, just eating. By the time they look up, sometimes they lose their way. Now what happens sometimes is when a sheep, well not sometimes, all the time, when a sheep loses its way, it just sits down. Just go poof, I'm done. I'm, I'm done, I'm lost. There are some members out there who have just given up and just say I'm done because I'm lost and we need to go find them because they were grazing and they lost their way. And we need to look out for each other as a church. But it takes work. Now watch this. It says that he went. Go to verse 4 real quick. To verse 4. It says this. In verse 4 it says, Now when he goes to find the sheep, he says he goes and he tries to find the sheep that was lost until he what? Finds it. We cannot be okay with just one phone call. We cannot be okay with just one text message. We cannot be okay with just one, one reach. I'm reaching out to you, and because the person doesn't respond, we give up. The idea in the text is the shepherd goes after the sheep and does not give up until he finds the sheep. You cannot give up in finding somebody. What would have happened if somebody gave up on you? How many tries did it take for you to come to Jesus? How many phone calls did it take? How many sermons were preached before you made the decision to give your life to him? My point is, we can't afford to let the sheep wander away. We can't afford to let people's souls be lost. Look at verse 5. It says that when he has found it, he lays it on his wife, shoulders, rejoicing. Now, here's the beauty of this. Here's the beauty of this. It wasn't just any little lamb. When he found a regular sheep weighs at least 75 pounds. You guys saw the picture? Can I paint the picture? You all all right? I'm going to preach anyway. The shepherd climbs up. Watch the picture. He has to climb up mountains. Go through the valley. Around caverns and crevices. Just to find the sheep. Come here, David. When he finds the sheep, when he finds the sheep, come on, man. You're not fighting, man. But I want to see the picture. I want to see the picture. When he finds the sheep, it's not no little lamb. This sheep is huge. 
So. Just persons who need to what? No repentance. 
I remember, I think I've shared this story with you before, but I think it's relevant right here. I don't know how old I was, but I got crazy when I was young. And I decided to run away from home. By the butler, you know, I thought I was justified in running away from home. I'm the oldest brother. All the pressure is on me. First child, first grandchild. My siblings won't listen to me. I jacked them up, they still won't listen to me. <laughs> Try to tell them what to do. My mother leave instruction. She said, Dwayne, you do this. Sean, Shanae, you do this. They just won't listen to me. But for me, watch this now. For me, at the time, it was justified for me to run away. Let me just drop this nugget real quick. See, you may say, why did sister so-and-so leave or brother so-and-so leave? Let me just park right here and say this to you. Don't you ever, in your God-ordained life, take your feelings and thought process and put it on somebody else. It may not make sense to you, but for that person, it's real. So don't go judging that sheep to say, well, that sheep should not have left. That person should have known better. No, don't, don't get into that business because what you do when you start doing that is you then take that negativity to that person and you've already judged them where they are and you have no earthly idea what they were dealing with. So I was justified in running away. Oh, but Corey, man, I don't know what I was doing. For two hours, I walked around the same block. <laughs> because truth be told, I didn't want to leave. <laughs> Can I start thinking about the food at home? <laughs> Had no money? Where am I going to sleep? What am I doing? Two hours. Yeah, made a whole dramatic scene. I'm leaving. I'm done. Nobody loves me. No, 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 no. I'm left. Left. Two hours. And I felt bad, so I moved another block. <laughs> but my mother turned the block. There was my mother. Still in her work uniform. Still in our heels. And in Jamaica, our roads are not as smooth and nice as the roads here in America. So sister girl was stepping in her heels with her, her stockings on in the heat of the day, looking for herself. And let me tell you this, Northeast. I knew when I saw her. I already played in my mind, I'm going to get a whooping. <laughs> and I got a whooping. But that was the sweetest whooping I ever had. Because <laughs> nothing felt so good that when she saw me and I saw her and the tears just came out, I just ran to her and just buried myself in her arms. I don't know how long you've been walking on the same block, yeah. making the same mistakes, committing the same sin, yeah. probably walking with the same person. But Jesus is right around the corner. Yeah. And he's saying to you, don't ignore me, but just, just come and fall into my arms. And not only Will the church rejoice? But heaven will rejoice over your repentance. The beautiful picture of Northeast is not that you're coming back to the church, but you're coming back to the arms of the shepherd of your life that to deal with when a sheep goes out there into the elements, you're facing the, the enemy, you have a, the possibility of being eaten, you're bruised, you're hurt, but when you come to Jesus, yeah. he heals you. Yeah. He covers you. Yeah. He holds you. Yeah. 
He loves you. And he whispers in your ear, not empty promises, but words of life. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but you've been wandering around like a lost sheep. Whether you've been here for years and you've been alone, stop being alone and say, Jesus, I give you all of me. I'm tired of walking by myself. I'm tired of being out there. Only you can cover me. Now the song makes sense. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You won't want for anything because he'll give you all that you need. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but you need to stop running, stop hiding, and come to Jesus. Stop if you are a child of God and you've been turning your nose up at the people that need to be saved. God is saying, take on my attitude and stop, stop being like the scribes and Pharisees. No one has any right to judge anybody because everybody needs the blood of Jesus. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but even right now when I'm talking, don't wait for the song, but just come forward. If you need to be delivered from your sins, be delivered from, from, from turning your back on God, being delivered from your addictions, being delivered from yourself. This is your time. Say, my time. My time. Whose time is it? Time. Whose time is it? Time. So don't sit there and leave the way you came in this morning. Jesus. Only Jesus. Just heal us. He is a shepherd. Be a good sheep and listen to the voice of the shepherd as we stand and as we sing. Careless, oh, why will you linger?